thank you very much and it's great being here. Um, so in this um, presentation, I will discuss the uh, development of different components for uh, creating a dynamic system, a system for uh, evaluating people with aphasia and specifically people who have word finding deficits. And I've structured the presentation so that in the first part, I will discuss how uh, we've developed a computer adaptive test for quantifying the overall severity of anomia in this clinical population. And in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the development of a series of algorithms that we can use to automatically classify uh, different types of paraphasic errors. So, um, word retrieval deficits or anomia is a core feature in aphasia, and practically all people uh, who have suffered a stroke and are suspected of having aphasia are assessed uh, to see whether they have word finding deficits. And typically across research and clinical settings, uh, the assessment of word retrieval includes uh, the administration of a, of a confrontation picture naming um, test. The underlying assumption is that the uh, cognitive processes on which performance on a confrontation naming test um, depends are also critical for spoken language production. So we can learn something from confrontation naming tests uh, and we can apply that to uh, uh, spoken uh, discourse of language production. However, despite their widespread use, confrontation naming tests, the way they are used right now, are limited in a number of different ways. For example, the tools that are currently available for the most part uh, assume a constant measurement error, um, which basically means that when we see results on confrontation naming test, uh, the assumption is that it doesn't matter who we're assessing, when the uh, test quantifies the reliability, that's the same regardless of whether you're testing a person who has severe deficits, mild deficits, or they're somewhere in between. Um, however, we know, like professionals working with people with aphasia, they know that from experience, they know that a test is not equally reliable for quantifying anomia, um, and it kind of depends on who we're testing. So that's one of the limitations that hopefully the work we're doing will be addressing. Another limitation is that um, the way that we are now developing confrontation naming tests or have been developing confrontation uh, naming tests does not allow us to directly compare scores across different diagnostic tools. Um, for example, imagine that you have two individuals here. Uh, one of them sees a test that has items like cat and dog. The other person sees a test that has items like stethoscope and microscope. Even if a person gets like a lower percentage score uh, on the second test, will be it's going to be very hard to argue that Jack is more severely impaired than John in this particular case. The reason being that test the second test includes items that are much harder compared to the first test, and that challenge in direct in being able to directly compare scores across different uh, diagnostic tools disrupts the flow of diagnostic information in clinical settings. It kind of depends. Uh, we might need to reevaluate patients as they transition from one setting to another, depending on what kind of tools are available from one hospital or one setting to the other. It also affects our ability to conduct robust meta analytic studies if we cannot directly compare scores or performances or uh, results in studies that have used different confrontation naming tests. So, that's another major uh, limitation, with, uh, limitation with currently available tools. Another thing is that um, currently available confrontation naming tests uh, can distort change scores. And to illustrate that point, I have an example here. Imagine we have two individuals and they've seen the same test, but they're being tested twice. And one person and something, so we have pre, let's say we have pre and post treatment uh, testing. One person goes from 20% to 50% and the other person goes from 70% to 100% uh, on the same test. Now, let's imagine now that you're either a clinician or a researcher and you're trying to answer the question, who benefited the most from the treatment? Did they benefit the same from the treatment? If you're tempted to say yes, then you are probably making an assumption that the change that we see in the observed scores is linearly related to uh, the change that we would 
expect to see in the underlying ability that drives the change in the observed scores. And I will show you later data, empirical data, that actually suggests that, that that's not the case. And even though the percentage, the difference in percentage scores here is the same, in fact, those two people might not have benefited from the treatment in the same way. So that's another limitation that we're uh, addressing with the machinery that we have uh, developed. And finally, uh, one of, at least with respect to this presentation, the other limitation with currently available tools is that they're inefficient. And that means that uh, for the most part, uh, confrontation naming tests uh, require the administration of a predetermined set of items, regardless, regardless of who's being tested. And that can uh, lead to a uh, high testing burden for clinicians, which can have an impact, especially if they're working in a fast-paced clinical setting. And the other thing that's very important as well is that that can lead to increased patient frustration and fatigue. If you're mildly impaired and you're being asked as part of a confrontation naming test to name very easy items, that can potentially lead to uh, frustration. Uh, if you are severely impaired and you're asked to name very difficult items, that can lead to frustration. And those things can contaminate performance and potentially they can lead to inaccurate or invalid uh, you know, clinical, uh, clinical inferences. So to address this, uh, these limitations, uh, my colleague William Hula, who's in the VA in Pittsburgh, and I uh, decided to use item response theory. Uh, which is a psychometric framework that is widely used in large-scale assessment in education and psychology, but not so much in our in our field. And what we uh, what we did back in 2015, uh, we pulled uh, archival data from the MOS database that has um, responses from people with aphasia, specifically 276 people uh, with aphasia, um, on the Philadelphia naming test. And we used item response theory to model specifically the Philadelphia naming test. What IRD allows us to do is that we can now predict, or it has models that allow us to predict the probability that a person will respond correctly to a given item in a test as a function of the person's ability level and the difficulty of that particular item. So unlike classical test theory, based on which the confrontation tests, uh, tests that we have now uh, are developed, item response theory allows us to model the responses to every given item or every specific item within a test. So the way that works, so we have a mathematical expression here for a simple IRT model. And on the figure here, on the y-axis, you have the probability of a correct response. On the x-axis, you have the ability of different uh, individuals. And in IRT applications, that ability uh, continuum ranges from negative three to about three, uh, where negative three means that somebody's severely impaired and the mild end is uh, on, the, on the other end. So what you can see here, those solid uh, curves are the uh, model implied item characteristic curves. Those are curves based that, are, that correspond to this model that tell you what's the probability that a person with a given ability level will be naming each of those three name, uh, items correctly. And we have three, these curves correspond to three items from the Philadelphia naming test, cat, iron, and microscope. And as you can see, somebody who's severely impaired um, has a very low probability of uh, naming correctly the item microscope and a somewhat higher uh, probability of naming the item um, CAD, if you go in somewhere in the middle of the distribution, you can see that the probability of correctly responding microscope, even for that person, is relatively low, but the probability of naming iron is much higher, and there's a very high probability that a person will respond correctly to an item like, uh, like CAD. So those are the model implied functions. The dashed lines are empirical data from the 276 people with aphasia. So when we do the IRT modeling, we have to go through a process called calibration to identify what's the difficulty of each of those items, which will then allow us to basically figure out where those curves should be. How basically, and the, the, the way that we calibrate the test is basically by trying to, conceptually trying to align the model implied curves to the empirical data. 
But once we do that, once we've identified the difficulty of the items, then we can estimate. So once we have the difficulties and we have responses on items, we can estimate a person's ability level. And what's, uh, what's very useful for us is that we don't have to administer the same items in order to get scores that are on the same metric. Once we have the difficulty parameters uh, and they have been jointly calibrated, then we can administer any subset of the items and those will give us scores, ability estimates that are on the same metric. So then that means that we have the ability to administer differences of items and still get scores that are directly comparable. The other, another concept that is very uh, useful and that's central in item response theory is information. And information basically quantifies how much our uncertainty about a person's ability estimate would be reduced if we administer a specific item. So here you can see the uh, information functions for those three uh, same items, CAT, iron, and microscope. And you can see that different items, depending on their difficulty, are gonna be informative uh, for different uh, regions of the ability spectrum. So for example, CAT is gonna be informative for individuals who are on the severe end of the distribution, but they're not gonna be informative for uh, individuals who are on the uh, mild end of the distribution. And following the same logic, an item like microscope is gonna be informative for people who are on the mild end of the distribution, but less and less informative for individuals who are on the severe end of the distribution. So once we've calibrated items, we can we have a sense of what's the probability of correctly responding to that item. We also get the uh, information functions uh, that correspond to uh, each of those items. Now what's important, and here's another figure that kind of has the same uh, inf similar information. What's important is that information has an additive uh, nature. So we can combine information from different items. So in the second panel, we have a test form that has only two items and we can sum the information from those two items and we can get the total um, test information function for this test that has only two, um, two items. And the reason we care about this is because based on that, we can get the standard error measurement for that particular um, test, which corresponds to this dashed line. And that is what's being used to construct 95% confidence intervals around ability estimates that we get from a test like this. And as you can see, unlike the constant um, standard error of measurement that currently available tools use, if you construct a test using item response theory, depending on which items are part of that test, you can then generate confidence interval, intervals that are tailored to, uh, you know, depending on who you're testing. So if you have an item, a test that has very easy items, then you're gonna have more information for estimating ability scores in that region, and your measurement is gonna be more reliable when you see patients with that level of ability. Now, if you're testing somebody who's on the very mild end of the distribution, those confidence intervals are now going to be much wider and they're going to be rep representative of the unreliability of the test. The other thing is that we can add additional items if we want to increase the information of the test and therefore increase its precision. So from what we've done, uh, so based on the work that um, we did in the past in 2015, when we calibrated the Philadelphia naming test, uh, we knew the difficulty of the parameter of the, of the different items. Uh, and that meant that we also knew what is the region of ability for which those items are gonna be maximally informative. So based on IRT and simulations that Will Hula primarily run in the, in the VA in Pittsburgh, we, thought it was very feasible to create a computer adaptive test that basically tries to find what are the, the, the maximally informative items from the PNT and ignores items that are very easy or, or too easy or too hard, depending on who's being tested. And to kind of give you a sense of how that works, um, I have this, uh, uh, this figure here. So, the way that com uh, computer adaptive testing works is that we have a person, they sit in front of a computer, and there's an algorithm that uh, first we need to assign some provisional ability level. 
So here on this figure, you have ability level on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, uh, you'll see how the ability estimate is going to change as a function of the administration of new items. So in the beginning of computer adaptive test, we assign a provisional ability level. Typically, that's somewhere in the middle of the distribution. And then the algorithm goes in and selects and administers the most informative PNT item for that current ability level. Then the clinician online scores the response as correct or incorrect. And using that information, the computer adaptive test re-estimates the ability and the standard error. So it re-estimates the, the precision. And then that ability estimate is revised, and you can see the revised uh, estimate on the, on the figure. Now, the, the algorithm will check whether a stopping rule has been satisfied. And that stopping rule is typically a set number of items. So we can say, keep administering items until you reach 30 or 40 or 52 or whatever we want it to be. Or it could be a criterion that is that depends on precision. You can ask the algorithm to keep administering items until it reaches a certain level of precision. So if that stopping rule has been satisfied, then great, it stops, it gives you an ability estimate and a standard error. If it hasn't, then it goes back to step two and chooses a new item that's going to be now informative for the new ability level. So it's not going to be too hard or too easy for that new ability estimate. And the process is repeated over and over and over again. And following this sequence, the, the algorithm or the computer adaptive test quickly converges to the, person, to the person's ability estimate by ignoring a large number of uninformative items. And for this particular example, uh, and the, the study that I'm going to show you later, the stopping rule is basically administer 30 items. So we had done simulations back in 2015 based on archival data, and we said, yeah, this is very feasible. Potentially, we should try this out. And then to confirm that, because simulations are oftentimes the upper bound of what you can achieve, um, we decided to do a study that was funded by NIDCD where we collected empirical data, new data, and what we wanted to do is verify the precision of the computer adaptive test engine. And specifically, we're interested to see whether a computer adaptive test that uses only 30 items from the Philadelphia naming test that, uh, for people who are not familiar, typically has 175 items. So we wanted to see whether we could create a computer adaptive test that uses only 30 items as opposed to 175. Uh, and and then we were interested in looking at uh, the agreement across the two versions of the test. And we did that by checking the relative agreement, checked to see whether there was bias uh, associated with the computer adaptive test. And then we also looked at the absolute agreement of the two versions. So we collected data from 47 participants, people with aphasia, and you can see here the uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And here you can see the demographics. Uh, and you can see the gender distribution reflects the fact that a lot of our, of our recruitment took place at the, in the VA system. And what we did is we asked those people to come twice the first time. And those uh, sessions were approximately two weeks apart. Uh, we asked them to take the full PNT the first time. Uh, we asked them to take the computer adaptive version of the PNT. And we counterbalanced the order. Uh, we customized the software and we developed the software and we had two raters uh, during the sessions to resolve any disagreements online. And here's the results that we got. So after running the, the, the study with 47 participants, here's an estimate that's a Bayesian correlation. Then the correlation between the full version of the PNT, scores on the full version of the PNT that has 175 items, and the computer adaptive version of the PNT is 0.95, and you can see the credible intervals uh, around that. So there was very high relative agreement between the scores you would get on a computer adaptive test and the full test. And I should also say that in our sample, it took about 35 to 40 minutes to administer the full PNT on average took about eight minutes to administer the short form of the PNT. So there's a significant gain in efficiency right there, um, and especially when you consider the relative agreement uh, across the two versions. 
we then check to see whether there's any bias associated with the uh, with uh, the computer adaptive version of the PNT, and we could not detect any. There was not you know, the the the, column, the credible intervals include zero. Even if there is, it's going to be very very minimal. So we don't think that that probably is going to be a concern. And then we turned our attention. Oh, before I go there, so these are two density plots. Uh, one is based on the scores on the full PNT. The other one's based on the results on the PNT CAT30, the computer adaptive version. And if I didn't tell you which color corresponds to which version, you cannot really tell the difference. Um, so then we turn our attention to absolute agreement and the root mean square deviations for across the two tests was 0.46. Uh, and that reflects at least two things. First of all, people with anomia or aphasia in general are somewhat like their performance fluctuates, so we do expect some noise to come from that. Uh, the other thing is part of that, uh, at least some part of that uh, um, lack of perfect absolute agreement has to do with the fact that we do lose some precision when we administer a test that has only 30 items compared to 175. The question is, can we minimize the loss of precision by maximizing efficiency? And these are now the two uh, standard deviations, or like basically those curves show you um, how much uh, unreliability each test form has. So this curve corresponds to the uh, uh, unreliability of the full PNT. This corresponds to the unreliability of the computer adaptive version of the PNT. And those are the curves based on which we can construct 95% credible intervals around the ability estimates. And as you can see, the full PNT is more informative uh, in general, and that's expected. Um, the computer adaptive version of the PAT, PNT is somewhat more uh, um, uh, unreliable, especially for people who are like at the two ends of the distribution. And the main reason for that is that the PNT in general does not have very easy or very hard items. So it has, it's maximally informative for people who are in the middle of the distribution. So when we do the computer adaptive testing, the algorithm has many items to pull for like assessment in that region. But when we were assessing people on the two ends of the distribution, the algorithm will try to find very hard items, but it will not find any there. So that's, very helpful for us to understand both you know, the, 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 the advantages and limitations of the way that um, the uh, item bank, the calibrated items, uh, and how they influence the precision of the test. This is also great for understanding what we need to do to improve uh, the assessment of overall severity um, of anomia. The clear one solution to increase the precision uh, would be to ask the algorithm to administer more items. Like that would be one thing. We chose to do 30 uh, to compare with research that I had done in the past, but that's not something that is fixed. Uh, so we could increase the number of items that we're administering. The other solution, which basically will have more of an impact, is to enrich the item bank with more items. If the item bank has more items, then there's gonna be more items available for every ability level and the, the, the algorithm will have many more informative items for refining someone's ability level. So from this work, what we, uh, what we wanna emphasize is that it seems that we now have the uh, machinery to create or to, to administer a confrontation naming test that can <laughs> dynamically adapt to the level of the patient it can reduce the administration of unnecessary items, it can reduce the testing time, while at the same time minimizing precision uh, loss. And we're hoping that this will have, uh, this is gonna be useful both for like fast paced clinical settings and for researchers who potentially are interested in getting scores on the Philadelphia naming test, but they might not have the time to administer a 40 minute test uh, in, in their protocol. The other thing is that this particular uh, the, the computer adaptive test uh, we, we've developed, it can be tailored to specific applications. So for example, if you wanna, if you have like three minutes and you can administer only 10 items uh, for screening purposes, you can do that. You can get scores 
and the credible intervals will reflect the fact that you only administer 10 items. Uh, but if you have more time, you can choose to administer more items and you can get more, uh, more precision. Or knowing that uh, you now have a way to predict the precision as a function of how many items you can administer. If you're doing a treatment study and you know what's the effect size that you're targeting, then potentially you can set it up so that the confidence intervals are able to detect that effect size that you're predicting uh, your treatment um, effect will have. The other thing is this machinery allows you to get a better idea about how people change uh, as a, as a you know, in longitudinal studies. So this is the same example that I showed you before where the two individuals had an increase of 30% but they had a different starting point. And if you actually go through the uh, estimation of ability scores, you can see that one person improved considerably more compared to the other individual. But that is masked when you look at raw scores or percentage scores. And the other thing is that when scores are generated through IRT, those come with 95% credible intervals, and those can be used to do statistical testing, or you can test whether the changes you see are reflective or are reflecting true change or random, uh, random noise. So that's a great advantage, especially in a field where we have a lot of single subject designs. This machinery can also be used, especially if we enrich the item bank for generating multiple alternate, alternative uh, test forms that don't have the same items. So let's say someone's doing a treatment, they don't wanna be administering the same test over and over again, because there's gonna be learning effects. Potentially we can tell, uh, we can tell, and we already have the machinery in place, we can ask the computer adaptive test to administer 30 items, when the person comes back the next time, we can administer uh, 30 items again, but we can tell the computer adaptive test do not administer the items that were administered during that first session. And even though the person is not gonna see the same items, their ability estimates are gonna be on the same metric. And finally, this machinery allows us to create some a universal metric for quantifying anomia overall. It's, it's um, and in our field, you know, we have multiple different tools that people are using, but the quantifying severity um, should not depend on which test or the measurement of anomia should not depend on which test someone's using. Like when we're measuring length, like that does not depend on which measurement stick someone's using, right? So we have a common sense universal metric for quantifying length. The IRT machinery potentially can allow us to uh, overcome that, so not have to rely on different tests, and potentially creates a framework within which we could calibrate all or the majority of picturable nouns. So have an item bank that is large enough to include all or the majority of picturable nouns. So I don't wanna leave you with a message as far as this work is concerned that we're developing another test. Like our goal is to eventually, and publishers, be concerned about that, but our goal is to get to a point where we don't have like five or ten different tests. If our goal is to create, if our goal is to get an overall sense of anomia severity. So that concludes the first part that is focused on overall severity of anomia. The second part has to do specifically with uh, algorithmic error classification. So when we assess people with anomia, we rarely are interested only in how severely impaired a, per, impaired a person is. Um, oftentimes we're interested in the relative strengths and weaknesses of patients. And to do that in a lot of clinical and research settings, what people will do is they will take the uh, uh, paraphagic productions and they will classify them into different categories. And based on that, they will try to make inferences about the underlying cognitive deficits of the individual. However, that process can be time consuming. It can be uh, error prone, especially uh, as a function of how complex the classification criteria are. And it leads to less than optimal reproducibility. So we thought that if we could automate, if we make it easier to classify paraphasias, that would be great. 
because then more people, especially in busy clinical settings, could be uh, generating those profiles that have a lot of rich diagnostic information. Also, that machinery could be used to recode extant databases very efficiently, and importantly, they could um, they could be used to generate the input for multidimensional um, measurement tools for anomia, like the one Walker and his colleagues are developing, and probably they will be talking about that in a couple of weeks. So to do this work, what we've done is we've uh, retrieved uh, data from the MOS database. We retrieved about 12,000 uh, errors, paraphasia, uh, paraphasias from the MOS database. Those are uh, errors uh, from people with aphasia who were administered the Philadelphia naming test. And for this, uh, at this point, where at this stage, we're developing algorithms for classifying correctly these particular categories, being the ones that, uh, that are the most common and uh, in, in, in the database. So we're targeting specifically mixed, semantic, formal, other, and then the two types of neologisms, phonologically related neologisms and abstruse neologisms. So the way that we are developing uh, those algorithms is that we're generating a number of semantic features, three features uh, specifically, and then using those features, we uh, develop uh, the tools to classifying them into different categories. So for example, uh, if, a, if based on a lexical uh, feature, something is a real word, and the production of the error is semantically and phonologically related to the target, then most likely that will be classified as a mixed paraphasia. If on the other hand, something is deemed to be a real word, uh, and it's semantically related to the target, but not phonologically related to the target, is going to be classified as a semantic paraphasia. So I'll walk you through now what are the three features that we're uh, using for classification. So for the lexical classifier, um, we're using frequency counts from Suplex, which is based on TV and movie subtitles. So for every production, we find its uh, frequency value, and if that value is above a certain threshold, then we tag that as a real word error. If it's below a threshold, then we tag that as a noun word. And that's a deviation from the Philadelphia naming test uh, guidelines. And the reason we opted to go this way, or I should say according to the PNT, uh, something is considered to be a real word if it's uh, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. The reason we didn't want to do that is because we wanted to avoid jargon homophones. So sometimes people with aphasia will produce a non-word that just happens to match a very rare English word. So we didn't want to be tagging those as real words. So we're using this frequency count, and that's what we're um, and that's what we're using for the lexical classifier. So for the semantic feature, we are employing a widely used uh, computational model of lexical semantics. Um, and uh, specifically, we're using the continuous uh, bag of words architecture that was developed by Mikolov back in 2013 that is based on the assumption that we can model distributional properties of words uh, based on their co-occurrence in very large corpora, corpora that consist of billions of words. So this is a very intensive, uh, computationally intensive process for training uh, this particular model that took several hours on a high-performance computing cluster up at OHSU. Uh, but once we can do the training, what we get is vectors. Uh, we can get we get vectors that can be used to represent meaning in a multidimensional space. And those vectors are very long. They oftentimes have 500 or more um, dimensions. And to kind of give you a sense of like conceptually uh, how we use those vectors to estimate the semantic similarity between a target and a production, I have this toy example here uh, that has only two dimensions. And in this particular case, you can think of those dimensions, animacy and size, but in real applications, those dimensions don't have a specific meaning. I'm just using this for this example. So in this two-dimensional space, uh, you can think of like mouse and cat and elephant having vectors in this, uh, in this neighborhood, as opposed to other items that are inanimate and they're 
they would be down here. So if we're interested in comparing um, two words like mouse and cat and make a determination as to whether those are semantically related or not, we can compare them using the cosine of this angle right here. And we can basically make a comparison, does mouse, is mouse more similar to cat compared to mouse and car, for example. So that's the feature we're using for every production. We see what's the um, semantic similarity or the cosine similarity. Uh, like I said, what's the cosine similarity between the production and the target? And here is a distribution of the cosine similarities for all the productions um, and targets in the MOS database. So what we do then is we say if the cosine similarity is greater than a threshold, then tag those uh, productions as being semantically related to the target. If it's below that threshold, then the, 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 the classifier most likely will classify that as a semantically unrelated production to the target. And finally, to generate the phonological feature, what we're doing is we're, we're directly implementing the Philadelphia Naming Test guidelines uh, for phonological similarity. And that's a rule-based system using string alignment. And according to the PNT, the production and the target are phonologically related if one of those conditions is satisfied. So if two or more phones at any positions are shared, or if the production and the target share the stressed vowel, the initial phone, the final phone, or one or more phones aligned at a corresponding syllable and word position. So we're taking the PND basically guidelines, we're creating a rule-based system, and if one of those rules is triggered, then we say that the production is phonologically related to the target. So going back to this, that conceptually tells you how we use the features. We're using uh, suplex frequency counts to generate the lexical feature. We're using semantic or cosine similarity to generate the semantic feature. And we have this rule-based system for generating the phonological system. And I know this is a busy slide, but that's more or less our blueprint of how our system works. And I just want to point out that there's a lot of things. So there's a lot of pre-processing so the algorithm, the way it works now, it requires us input phonemic uh, transcriptions of paraphasias. And those phonemic transcriptions in our field typically are going to be in IPA. But a lot of the tools that we're using require um, that the IPA is not a common thing in natural language processing. So as part of the pre-processing step, we have to convert IPA to a different system called ARPABED then we have to create a orthographic transcription, we have to add stress, we have to syllabify the production, and that's all part of our, uh, our pre-processing. Once that happens, then we can go into generating the features, um, so the semantic, the lexical, the frequency, the semantic similarity, whether uh, morpheme is shared between the target and the production, and also the phonological uh, feature. And those are the features that are then fed into a classifier, where for this particular example, uh, the way I've been presenting it is just a simple decision tree. What I would like to emphasize is that we have put a lot of effort into creating a system or a framework for evaluation. So that means that this particular uh, framework here is very modular, meaning that it's very easy to go in and make small changes or big changes in one part of the, of the code without necessarily breaking the rest of it. So if someone was interested in using um, a different frequency uh, database, you could go and substitute just that and the rest of it will work the same way. Or if you're interested in a different semantic, um, as generating the semantic feature in another way, you could substitute that and then you could the, the rest of the system will work just fine. The other thing is that this has been optimized to run in a cluster, so we can do extensive repeated sampling and careful cross-validation, which is going to be great for comparing different models as we develop the, uh, the system, and also it's going to help us with getting more realistic expectations about its accuracy. So how is it doing so far? So here you can see a classification or confusion matrix of uh, that we up on the on the up here you can see the how the machine classifies different errors here's how the human annotator 
uh, has classified errors and the values on the diagonal uh, reflect their um, absolute agreement. And as you can see, the vast majority of uh, errors across those 12,000 are classified correctly. Um, we have far than uh, perfect agreement though. As you can see, a lot of those cells in the off diagonal, um, they, they represent how we misclassify errors. So for example, if we look at formal errors, uh, our machine and the human agree uh, that out of, you know, out of the 2,400 errors, uh, 1,700, uh, there's agreement for, for those, but our machine will see, will classify as real uh, word errors, 300 productions that the humans see as non-words. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of things that the human annotator sees as phonologically related to the target, but not semantically related to the target. But our machine will tell you that, nope, there is some semantic relationship there. Now, there's a lot of information in this uh, classification matrix. There's a lot of things that uh, influence how we misclassify. Um, and at this point in our development, uh, we're interested in sort of like not deba debugging, but improving the different classifiers. So in order to do that, what I've done or what we've done is we've looked at the performance of the different classifiers or the different features. So what I've done here, I have the, the, the uh, repartition the data set to items, that, to productions that are real word and productions that are non-words. And we're looking at how many times we agree with human annotators on just that feature. And that will allow us to see how well we classify real word and non-word um, errors in the, in the database. And as you can see, there's high agreement between the machine and the algorithm when it comes to making a judgment uh, on whether something is a real word or not. We do have some disagreement though as well. And what we're doing uh, is exploring as part of like our work now is we're exploring uh, where that disagreement is coming from. So we have, uh, we're spending a lot of time doing an error discrepancy analysis so we can see what's the source of those errors. And what we've seen is that a lot of uh, big proportion of those discrepancies might be coming from the data set or it might be associated somehow with how the human annotator has coded those paraphrases. So asking the algorithm to have perfect agreement when there's error in the, in the, in the ground truth is somewhat unrealistic. So one of the big categories that's causing um, error or disagreement is the fact that there's sometimes uh, a discrepancy or uh, disconnect between the IPA, the phonemic transcri transcription of the uh, production, and the orthographic transcription of the same production. So our algorithm is using, uh, and here's an example, so banana might be the target and the, and the production is APA without an, the final L consonant. So our algorithm is using the phonemic transcription and it says there's no such word, but there's an orthographic transcription in the same data set that says Apple, and the human annotator most likely is using that and say and says, well, this is a semantic error, but our machine basically says that's an neologism, that's a non, a non word. There's also a, uh, several um, productions that the human will classify as a non word error, even though those are entries in the Webster, Merriam Webster dictionary. And they also have a frequency. Uh, account that is higher than our threshold. Now we also have issues with how our machine works. So for example, subtlex that, that is based on movies and um, subtitles from movies and uh, TV shows uh, seems to overestimate the frequency with which certain words or strings appear like phi, for example, for that's that's one of the examples. Phi will be based on the suplex uh, norms uh, is classified as a real word, uh, but the human does not consider that to be a real word. On the other hand, uh, there are words that are not represented in suplex or uh, the other dictionaries that we're using, like TP. So the target is pyramid. The person says TP, and for some reason that does not appear in suplex. Uh, the human will recognize that as a real word, but we will not. And also proper nouns. Right now, there's a number of errors 
uh, that we cannot correctly classify uh, because our algorithm doesn't recognize proper nouns. Uh, it treats them like every other word. Um, but there are specific rules in the PNT guidelines on how you're supposed to code those errors. So we're missing those as well. In terms of uh, now turning our attention to the font logical classifier, I've done the same thing where I've partitioned here the paraphrases based on the ones that are phonologically related to the target and the ones that are uh, phonologically unrelated to the target. And as you can see, we also have high agreement in terms of that feature. Um, we've looked at the discrepancies um, and we want to say that at least 54% might be directly related to uh, the human annotator. So, for example, there's a number of errors where uh, the, uh, the human annotator might be, might be misapplying the PNT scoring um, rules. For example, the only phoneme that is shared between the, tar the, 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 the word chicken and duck is that phoneme which though does not appear in the same syllable and word position. So strictly going by the PNT guidelines, that shouldn't be a phonologically related error. However, and there's a handful of those, when humans see this particular or like uh, pairs like this, they will oftentimes say that there is phonological similarity. A rule-based system will systematically say, nope, according to the PNT guidelines, that's not uh, that's not phonologically related. The other large category is uh, associated with like human annotators is that oftentimes they, not oftentimes, but a large proportion of the discrepancies could be attributed to the fact that human annotators will miss stressed vowels. So in this particular case, apple and banana, they share the same uh, stressed vowel, but we have a lot of examples where humans will say that those two are not phonologically related. On the other hand, our machine seems to systematically uh, have problems with morpheme identification. There are specific rules on how we're supposed to treat morphemes, but those apply specifically to compound words. Our algorithm seems to overgeneralize that rule. So every time it recognizes, well, sometimes when it recognizes uh, some uh, morpheme share, like in this particular case, the affix er, er, at the end of like slippers and flippers, it will actually use special rules and will automatically classify something as a semantic paraphasia, production of semantic paraphasia. So we're missing a lot of those. And the last thing associated with the phonological classification, last major category, is that the PNT guidelines permit uh, alternative correct pronunciations for some targets. But when a clinician tests a person, usually they will select one of those pronunciations and they will say, for this particular patient, given like probably who they are or their dialect, this is the most likely pronunciation and we will ignore the rest of them. Our algorithm for the most part cannot, not for the most part, they cannot, they cannot do that. So it has all available pronunciations as potential targets and it over uh, identifies phonological similarity. And finally, uh, we have the semantic classifier. And in terms of the semantic classifier, what we've done here is we've excluded all non-word errors. And you can see here the uh, agreement uh, across machine and human annotator. And you can also see the disagreement. And the values in those cells don't look very different compared to the other classifiers. But note that now this is out of 6,500 errors. So going by that, we kind of get a sense that most of our problems with misclassification might be coming from the semantic classifier, which is also one of the more challenging tasks out of the three that we're doing. So the main reason for that, we do have some uh, words for which we haven't been able to generate um, uh, semantic uh, or vectors or semantic representations, but the main challenge is word sense, that this notion that words have different meanings in different contexts. The machinery we're using now does not actually, is not uh, able to differentiate between diff different meanings. So imagine an example where we have a ruler as the target, the person says inch, a human can easily say those are uh, related. However, our machine will, or the algorithmic approach will say those, are, those two are not semantically related. And the reason is that our machine thinks or has associated the word ruler with someone who's the head of the state, as opposed to some measurement instrument. Um, and kind of give you a sense of like how that works. But another 
target in the PNT that we, we the algorithm struggles with is seal. So imagine the target is seal, the person says animal, everybody like human annotator would say those are semantically related. And going back to that um, toy example that I showed you, imagine that seal is our target, animal is up here, they're close enough in the semantic space, great. But this is what uh, another meaning of seal could be. So seal as like stamping or like seal as like, you know, uh, weatherproofing something. And depending on how you train the, uh, the, the, the word to vec or the SIBO architecture, it's possible that the vector representation is closer to the meaning of this seal as opposed to this one or you have some sort of like averaging between the two. And now that semantic similarity is not gonna, you know, uh, feature is not gonna be as accurate. So that's where potentially we get most of our errors are coming from our inability to kind of differentiate or tell um, you know, which meaning we should be uh, using. Um, so obviously we have a number of things to work on. As a baseline, the performance of the classifier is relatively good. It's a very solid baseline, but there are things that we can do to improve how pre-processing works. We can see whether we can uh, explore, so we can avoid things like you know, using a database that doesn't have words like TP. Most of our work right now is focused on the semantic classifier because that's where we have most of the, probably the most uh, errors coming from. And the other thing is that what I've used here for this presentation is a simple decision tree. All of those features could be fed to different classifiers. So there might be more sophisticated ways and we've been exploring those like, uh, like card algorithms or support, support vector machine. Um, and we'll be exploring this, especially now that we have this framework uh, ready and, and set up. So with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, William Hula and Alex at the VA and University of Pittsburgh, uh, the people at Oregon Health and Science University, uh, Steve, Katie, and Brooke, Mary Ann, who's the research SLP back at Portland State, and all the great students that have helped with uh, this research, and of course, an IDCD for the support uh, for this work. With that, thank you, and I'll take questions. We'll take questions from the room first, and then uh, we'll go to uh, any online questions then. Yes. Thank you for your talk. It was really great. I had a couple questions. I might have missed something, um, but I was curious about for the PNT, um, the very first part of your talk. When were they scored? Was it scored in real time from the adaptive test, or was there? Oh, yeah. yeah, so the question, the question is whether the, uh, the the PNT during the computer adaptive testing, uh, whether we score online, and yes, the answer is yes. So as the person is presenting with an item, someone makes a judgment, correct or incorrect, and then that's the information that is being used by the algorithm to re-estimate the ability. And yeah. no error types were considered at all? Yes, and uh, the question is whether error types are considered, and the answer is no. For administering, like for quantifying overall severity, um, that's not necessary for figuring out. And there are some categories that potentially might be relevant, but people would make a judgment right there on the online uh, about the correct or incorrect. I have just one more question. Uh, how is, I know that you mentioned um, this is a really great way to make clinical follow-ups and stuff and measuring change. How is test free test reliability of this since it is adaptive and they're not seeing the same thing? Um, so the question is, what's the reliability when we have computer adaptive testing and I'm assuming the administration of non, like forms that don't have the same items, correct? Mm -hmm. So we do have a paper that probably was accepted, no, I'm sure it was accepted recently in JSLHR and we're using as an, uh, the item bank, our item bank is just the PNT right now because that's what we have. Uh, the relative agreement between the two forms is uh, approximately 0.91 or 0.92, so it's somewhat lower than what we see with like the, you know, what we see in the, in the results today. And the main reason is that, like I said earlier, if you know, if you administer the PNT once and then the main item, the most informative items are not available anymore, the item bank is being depleted by, so depending on who you test, um, the, the 
uh, you know, the reliability might, might, might vary, it will vary. But overall, uh, it's, it's relatively, it can be useful, especially as a function of what kind of effect size you're interested in detecting. Um, but we also have a way of like being able to, if we, were, if we enrich the item bank, we'll be able to generate even more reliable test norms. So I guess, being up to what Lisa was saying, um, the PMT is sort of predicated on the fact that there's multiple ways in which items can be difficult, in particular depending on the patients, right? Some that stroke are morphological or lexical or some other potential kind of categories. So your approach is sort of predicated on a single dimension of difficulty. But you could imagine that maybe some patient is struggling to do morphological errors and the algorithm is saying, oh, I'm going to pick a hard item. It's a semantically hard item, but it's actually easy for the subject. So is there some issue there? So by not the, you know, including multiple dimensions for difficulty. Yeah, so the question is why, what's the justification of treating basically anomia as a unidimensional construct? Because that's the basic assumption, um, as part of my answer, that's one of the basic assumptions of doing IRT modeling, that, or at least picking using the model that we have used. So the, what we, the way we would conceptualize, and we have some evidence, uh, for naming deficits is that we can treat that as an emergent ability. Yes, there's multiple different cognitive processes that contribute to your ability to name overall um, overall something. And yes, you can do a more granular, granular uh, assessment of those deficits, so you can go in and look at those multi, you know, multiple dimensions at the same time. That serves a slightly different purpose from you know, quantifying the overall severity of anomia. So, what kind of evidence do we have that that's actually reasonable for measurement purposes? So as part of doing the ART modeling, we've done, we had to go through testing assumptions like unidimensionality and essential unidimensionality, conditional independence to see, is it reasonable to treat anomia as a unidimensional construct? And those analyses for the most uh, part, like they say, yes, it's useful to quantify overall anomia um, the same way that you can think of like measuring the speed of a vehicle, but there might be my, multiple reasons why a car is slowing down and then you open the hood and then now you can do multiple you know, different things to see exactly where the, the, the problem is coming from. Um, so overall it seems that yes, someone might have different problems um, that contribute to inability to name things, uh, but the evidence we have so far, it seems that it's at the very least useful to conceptualize anomia as a unidimensional construct for overall severity, because that has predictive utility for overall aphasia severity, its relationship with discourse indices. But we also agree that that's just part of the picture. Like the, the work like Walker, uh, Grant Walker is doing and his colleagues, that can definitely be something that is part of and will be that or something similar who would and should be part of like the overall. So these are just embedding a multidimensional adaptive test, right? Then you have just two axes that mm -hmm. can make a phonological type of error, then increase the logical, or you, you know, you have different dimensions yeah. where you just sample items. Yeah. So. so the question is whether, in principle, we could create a computer adaptive test uh, for a multidimensional model. And yes, in principle, in theory, uh, it might be slightly more complicated how to set it up. Uh, so you need to classify. Exactly. Online, which is not trivial, which would be great if you had Yes. So, and the motivation when I showed that slide there where we have multidimensional modeling and a classifier feeding into it, right? Like that's part of the motivation. In order to do computer adaptive testing with multiple dimensions, exactly, you will need to be able to classify errors online, feed that into the, 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 the test, and then from there proceed. Um, so, yeah, that's part of like where we envision a system like that at some point in the future. Yeah, excellent talk, very interesting. And to kind of uh, follow up on both of those questions, <laughs> so how hard would it be to actually enrich the database of, of the stimuli? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, like here, you need those difficulty estimates. Yeah, so the question is how hard is it to estimate, uh, to enrich the item bank, right? Because we were like, we, we went around, we, we found a database that had the data already collected and we did the modeling. And the reason that in our field we don't use IRT is not because we don't want to, right? It's not that 
the reason is that it's that difficult. You need large sample sizes to calibrate the items and then proceed to do all those great things. So that's a great question. Um, so in other fields, what they're doing is they're capitalizing on the properties of the items. So in other fields, they're saying, well, what is it that makes something difficult? And there we know already that there are certain things that make items difficult for people with aphasia or anomia specifically, like frequency, length, age of acquisition, concreteness, imageability. So you know, we have a paper out where basically we're using those kinds of variables to predict IRT difficulty parameters. So if we could, could create a predictive model of IRT difficulty parameters, then we might not have to rely on large calibration samples for enriching the item bank. And there are, uh, there are successful applications of the, this idea of instead of estimating empirically like the, the difficulty parameters, you predict them based on what you know about what makes difficult an item difficult. So that's one of the things that we want to explore because when I said earlier we want to create an item bank that includes all picturable nouns, I don't think that you know, funding source would be interested in uh, paying us to test hundreds and hundreds of people and ask them to name thousands of items. I think an approach like the one I'm describing is probably a much better way as long as we can validate that the predicted IRT difficulties would be similar to the ones that you get from um, traditional calibration. I have some questions and comments from both the research and the clinical side. From the research side, I'd like to start using your um, 30 item TNT right now. <laughs> <laughs> because 175 is through to a lot of participants. And, and I'd love to find a way to easily to, um, to do that. And so, yeah, as soon as it's ready, let us know. And also, Grant Walker's working on a similar machine learning kind of thing for us and, and our students. Some of our coders are in here um, that will help kind of check their work. So I, I appreciate that you're doing that. From the clinical side, I still have a question about how do we bridge the gap? You know, as a clinician, I might have, depending on my setting, 30 to 45 minutes to assess someone. I still don't have time to do 30 item naming tests that doesn't tell me anything about their queuing ability or how functional they are in naming. So how do we bridge that gap? I mean, I'm also looking at swallowing and syntax and morphology and comprehension. I'm looking at all of those things. So I still don't have time to do your adaptive test. Okay, so, so how can we get there? So the, so the question is, there's multiple things that clinicians need to squeeze in, basically, right? So there's so many things. Uh, how do we get there? So. We cannot solve all the problems, right? At the very least right now, one of the things we can do is efficiently reduce the length of a particular test and allow the clinician to tailor that to whatever time they have available. Um, how do you do it now? So it's usually like 10 items is the most that we can do. And we're looking at things like are these functional items for that person to test, maybe we're, pull, or maybe we're doing um, informal kind of things and, and asking the family well, what kind of things are important to them. But then we're also looking at how responsive are they to tactile cues or phonological cues or semantic cues. Because I'm, I'm looking at ways to treat them as well. Yeah. And this is just saying, yeah, they got you know, 25 out of 30. Sure. Results, sure. Results, so. uh, hopefully a little bit more than that, but nothing prevents one to use the computer adaptive test in similar ways. Like you can administer that like any other confrontation naming test. You can tailor it to the administration of just 10 items. The advantage here is that you will also have some estimate of like how unreliable that estimate is now. So there is some like, yes, I understand you need to shorten the test, but that comes at a cost. It costs precision. What this does is that it allows you to have a clear idea of what's the trade-off. If that's the case, then yeah, potentially that might still be something what either we need to work on or to the extent that you think a confrontation naming test has clinically useful information then we might need to go back and making room for that. I, I'm just thinking you need input from therapists as well as far as what's happening in their clinical 
productivity and how much time they actually have. Yeah. And I want to say that that's the driving force behind this work, right? Like I'm imagining that in most clinical settings for patients, uh, there is some sort of confrontation naming test that is being administered, right? Mm -hmm. That naming test is usually, it can be in a lot of hospitals, they come up with their own test for or for then those test, 10 test items are whatever they picked in that hospital. That machinery can be in place to actually, even if you want to administer just those test 10 items, you can still administer them. You can still get scores that assuming that the next hospital is using a different form, those scores are on the same metric. But even if that's the only reason that you're deciding to use this, I think, still think there's a lot of value into communicating that. So three weeks ago, this patient was here. Now that he's in your setting, he's here. By the end of the acute rehab, he's gonna be there. So even being able to directly compare in the absence of additional advantages, if those are not helpful in your clinical setting, I think there's value in even that feature. And for me, there's also value in being able to quantify with precision how reliable your test is, which right now is not Useful clinicians will ignore that information, but that's extremely useful for saying, making statements as to what statements as to whether your client got better or not. So even though it does not solve all the problems, it does solve some problems. I'm hoping. Let's ask how many items does your test usually require to require a stable estimate? Like, yeah. you, you don't usually need 30 items, right? Yeah, so I have a, uh, so the question is, how many items do we need to get a reliable estimate? And the answer is, it depends, of course. right? Like on average, right? So I think I did like a mini simulation for the paper we published a few months ago, where I think very quickly after like seven, eight, nine items, the relative agreement between that and the full PNT is up in the 0.85, 0.9. Um, so very quickly, you can get in that region where it can give you useful, uh, useful information. Yeah, the version of S, which really gives you an estimate of reliability, which is pretty good. And then you just say, well, that patient is not too reliable, so you can look at this again. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 In the computer adaptive test for severity, how is the provisional ability assigned? Is it based on clinician's preliminary evaluation or patient's speech data? So actually, that can, that's a great question. We've said, let's just, let's just use like zero. But if you've seen the patient, you've talked to them for like five minutes, you already kind of have a sense of what the ability level of the patient is. So you can actually say, don't start at zero, start at like two. Don't start at zero, start at negative two. And in theory, and hopefully that should also hold with empirical data, that will allow the computer adaptive test to more quickly converge to the person's uh, ability estimate. So your confidence interval would be? Yeah, so with the same number of items, if you start like at a region that is closer to the final ability estimate, you know, more items are gonna be informative instead of trying to get to that point, which happens quickly, but there's gonna be some uh, improvement if you inform uh, the, uh, the computer adaptive test that way. Okay. Oh, sorry, probably a silly question, but like, what is the, the ability of zero? Like, what is your kind of like? So that's a logic scale. So it, so that's where we would expect like, uh, based on the uh, on the modeling, that's where we'd expect most of the moderate uh, individuals to be. Um, so unlike, you know, other metrics where zero is like no ability at all, this is more like the middle of the distribution. So the average of the scores in the basically would be zero. Uh, or, or if, if it was perfect rated. I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, no, because, well, maybe. <coughs> it kind of depends. But it's more helpful to think about the, 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 the extremes. So negative three being like the severe, three being the, the, the very mild end. Uh, for example, we have a distribution of the ability scores for the cases in the MOS database. So you can get a sense of like what that distribution is um, and how that works with uh, other scores that I have on other uh, uh, tests or tasks. So that will give you a more qualitative sort of like sense. Of. Do you have to have empirical data, right? Where you tested patients like 
the exact correlate. For them. For like even a person's adaptive score on one scale, you can compute their exact score on Oh, on the PMG? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can, yeah, we can. Related we'll, comment from William Kula. Oh, thank you, Will. Who says, comment, the origin of this scale is the expected population average. Okay. So that would come down to the average score on the PMG. Even though that's not necessarily the score for a moderate patient, because not the average patient who yeah. does that test is not necessarily moderate. So that's why I was kind of struggling because I know yeah. the distribution of scores we get from the people in the MOS is not actually centered at zero because right. they're like a milder case, I think. Yeah. No, they're more slightly more severe. I have the figure somewhere, I think. Maybe not? No. Other questions? Go for it. So to ask about the second part of that. Mm -hmm. of the talk, right? So, uh, just curious, how does that um, sort of like computerized scoring handle like just like the differences in pronunciation, just you know, like regional differences? Like, yeah. Yeah, so right now we don't have like a way to handle those. Mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons, one's practical, we're using the, the phonemic uh, uh, transcriptions from MOS. Uh, but we certainly, we've been talking about once we have the system in place, how can we extend it to do that? My colleagues, Katie especially, is very interested in getting, when she hears about data, lots of data that are collected in different parts of the country, like that potentially, once we have access to that kind of data, we can start thinking about how do we take dialectal variation in, uh, in, into consideration, because uh, our goal is to create a system that is not fragile in terms of like, that kind of, of variation. So we're interested in that. Uh, we don't quite have the, the necessary data to systematically explore that issue. Yeah, that, that raises a similar question is that these are humans that are transcribing speech data, right? So they're probably inserting some of their own high level linguistic biases. They're not saying, here's a phonetic stream and I'm giving you a close phonemic approximation of that, right? They're saying, well, I hear words, so therefore this is going to inform their phonological assessments. So is there some danger there of, you know, taking a phonological transcription that is suddenly informed by higher-level variables, which are then trying to then model? So the, the question is whether the fact that we're using data from a MOS that have been transcribed by real people, and even subconsciously, right, like you can infuse uh, some of your biases into the way you code things. So that's a limitation that we are like, you know, that we have to live with. Uh, right. Now, you having said that, acoustic, you can take the acoustic waveform and somehow try to do Yeah, that. so the MOS database doesn't have the acoustic information, right? So we, we have to rely on the phonemic transcriptions. Having said that though, that's one of the reasons we're interested in cross-validating. So instead of relying on just on the MOS database in terms of figuring out, you know, per model comparison or generalizing, we also have data, additional data we're holding out for now, for which we already have acoustic, we also have acoustic information. And in anticipation of having to test whether the modulus performance is the same, you know, based on the training set, we want to see how it does with like um, you know, paraphrases that it hasn't seen before. That can be done with like our holdout or we can do cross-validation to kind of see how much of that uh, potentially might be influencing our uh, our results. So, and I also got to say that when we've coded the new data from, from a different grant, we've tried relatively, we've tried hard to think about that particular issue. So when we're coding, we're thinking about generating a data set that potentially can help with answering that question because we're always unaware of that particular issue. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.